Okay, we are live. Welcome everybody to today's webinar event from Endpoints in Focus held beyond AAV 1.0. My name is Kyle Blankenship. I'm the senior editor here with Endpoints News. Uh, I'll be moderating today's panel. This is really exciting for us because um, first of all, we have four amazing guests who will be joining us for today's conversation. But also in lieu of the sponsor introduction, I wanna take a moment to talk about the series that we're running here today. Today's webinar is the first in what will be a monthly series for Endpoints called In Focus. Um, looking at the biggest topics in biopharma. So this month, as the title indicates, is AAV delivery technology and gene therapies. We've got a great group of panels that are going to discuss that. Next month, yours truly will be covering preclinical, pre excuse me, R&D with a webinar associated. So if you like the report that came out from editor Jason Mass on Tuesday, if you like today's discussion, please come back. Each and every month, we'll have even more stuff for you. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. We will have a Q&A session at the, end of the, at the end of this discussion period, reserving about 15 to 20 minutes. So if you do have a question that you wanna send ahead, please go to the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. You can ask questions for the group in general or specifically for each speaker. Um, we'll try to get to as many as we can, so put them out there. Uh, very happy to hear your feedback and the questions that you have. Okay, without any further ado, our four panelists today uh, should be a great cross-section of the discussion we're having the first is Dr. Nicole Polk. She's an assistant professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Nicole, thanks for being here. Absolutely. Eric Kelsick, he is the CEO of Dino Therapeutics. Eric, thank you for being here. Yeah, and then, sure. And then finally, this should come as no confusion to me trying to keep these names together. The two Jeffs, Jeff McDonough, he's the CEO of Generation Bio. And then Jeff McKay, CEO of Avro Bio. Thank you both for being here. Pleasure. So this is a great topic, and it's one that for you know, I'm parachuting in to host this panel. Our editor, Jason Mass, as I previously mentioned, had a report that came out on Tuesday, effectively trying to look at what the current generation of adeno-associated viruses, AAVs, using gene therapies. Um, this is a space that has shown a ton of innovation, a lot of development over the course of the last decade, but it's also one that was formed, I found really compelling through really one death back in 1999, this is Jesse Gelsinger case. Um, and, you know, what that showed to me is looking at this from a person coming in, um, not reporting on this specifically, is how much of this field was developed in response to um, safety issues, um, using this technology really as a response to that and how big the spotlight is on this. Nicole, um, you in that reporter in the introductory session talking about the Gelsinger case in particular, um, and I thought it'd be great to start with you to give us sort of an introduction to where we stand, what the current state of affairs is with AAV. You know, this is a field that's come a lot of long way in 10 years. It still is very much in its early stages. Um, a lot of promise, but there's a lot of limitations in the current technology that we're seeing. So I'm hoping that, you know, you can kind of give us a current state of play with where AAV is and then what your team at UCFS is doing to um, really work on those limitations and make this a better model for delivery. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so if we kind of start with, start with Jesse's, Jesse's death, um, the field really kind of needed a, a new virus, a new tool and kind of new, a new safer path forward in order to deliver genetic medicines to patients. And so um, really kind of some of the shepherds of the field um, um, some of kind of the old guards, so, you know, Jude Simulski, David Russell, Kathy High, others um, were really some of the only folks who stayed around because um, when, when Jesse's death occurred, um, all of the clinical trial stops, all of the funding stopped, um, both from industry, what little there was um, from NIH, et cetera. And so um, the field really kind of died. Um, and there were really these giants of the field who decided to stick with it and, and come up with solutions to how we could get past this. And, uh, and that kind of fast forward, you know, all of those small steps along, along that decade to today, um, where now we're really starting to see the, the fruits of those labors and these clinical successes. And I remember um, when I, so I, my PhD, my postdoc, and now my, my academic uh, professor lab at UCSF has all been in AAV gene therapy. And I remember going back to the ASGCT meeting. Um, I think my first meeting was in 2005 and there was like 300 of us, we'd show up in jeans, not in suits. Um, and we would sit around and we'd talk about our, our unpublished data and there was not a single VC or investment banker <laughs> in the room uh, and we'd go have pizza and beers afterwards. Um, now that we're starting to see some success and all of that, you know, fast forward, now the meeting is, is 6,000 
uh, regular attendees, um, almost everyone is in a suit. Academics are outnumbered by our industry, our industry partners and, and our venture funders who are funding the industry teams. Um, and yeah, we're really starting to get these things into the clinic and, and really almost every kind of disease space, um, mostly in the monogenics, but you know, in skeletal muscle, in, in blood disorders, um, in liver disorders, I mean, you can kind of name it. Um, we're really all over the map. Um, and as far as what's holding the field back from going after even more diseases, so things like diseases that are not monogenic, but instead polygenic, so multiple mutations contributing to the disease, or even complex disorders that aren't genetic, um, most of that has to do with the age old problem that we've always had delivery, delivery, delivery. <laughs> um, can we deliver virus to where we want it? Um, so in some cases, uh, you know, like right now, today, AV doesn't really transduce the kidney. So if you wanted to go after a kidney disease, we really can't do that right now because we just don't have an AV capsid that can do that for us yet. And so we're going after the tissues and the diseases in the tissues where we have capsids that can go after that. So there's a huge need for kind of new capsids and new de delivery technologies. I'm sure Eric's going to touch on this in a minute. Um, the other huge problem in the field, as we've all heard a million times, is manufacturing. Uh, and I kind of talked about that in the piece on Tuesday, that even if someone was to come up with, you know, an AAV gene therapy for diabetes, congestive heart failure, and there are groups working on this today, and even if they succeeded today, we wouldn't be able to manufacture enough AAV for every last man, woman, and child on the planet who has both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So, you know, what would we do if someone came up with one of those really huge enabling innovations? Um, and so we're going to need an equal amount of effort and innovation in the manufacturing space. Um, and to kind of address these, these and, and more needs uh, that I won't necessarily cover for time, um, my lab has tried to be um, pretty agnostic. Um, about things like uh, the species we're working on, the tissue, the organ, the disease, the pathway, the gene, um, and have tried to stay much more kind of at 10,000 feet at the platform level uh, and tried to develop enabling technologies to kind of help all boats rise for the entire platform. So how can we make AAVs cheaper? How can we make them easier? How can we make them faster? And how can we apply them to as many different diseases as possible, both ones we're already going after, but also diseases that we're not currently able to attack. And so everything from kind of the capsid level to the genome level, to the new ways of manufacturing the virus, to new ways of delivering it to policy issues. So we're, we're kind of up in the clouds uh, at the platform level. Oh, Kyle, you're on mute. <laughs> now I'm on unmute. Um, We've you know, had our Zoom had moment. You gotta yeah, have one Zoom moment. Yeah. yeah, one one big gaff. Um, I'm interested. You've had recent literature that I've seen, Nicole, in gliomas and, and liver uh, disease as well. I'm, these are areas that huge unmet clinical need, and I think the undercurrent of this discussion should be that gene therapy uh, through AAV is still very much a developing field. I mean, these are areas of therapeutic focus that have a huge amount of unmet need, and this can still fill that need. So as we go into further down the road and looking. A couple of the people here who are working on really making it a better technology or looking at the space completely outside of AAV and what the possibilities are there, there's a lot of innovation left to do. Can you talk a little bit about that work? You know, you mentioned targeting, um, you know, areas where gene therapies have really not cracked the code yet. In terms of what your team is doing in those spaces, what are you learning about, um, if not rewriting the, the code altogether, how to make AAV better for those specific fields? Um, and like you said, you know, trying to get ahead is it really is about optimizing this technology currently. So speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So if we kind of play on the analogy I was talking about before, so right, if you want to go after a kidney disease and there are some phenomenal kind of low hanging fruit, uh, monogenic disorders in the kidneys, things like polycystic kidney disease. Um, even if you had something that was effective for that and you were able to, you know, brute force it in animals, um, we don't have something, we don't have a capsid that's able, at least by normal methods of administration. And when I say normal, the vast majority of clinical trials with AAV are doing systemic administration intravenously. Um, so we just don't seem to have a capsid that can really transduce the kidney. And so you can do all kinds of protein engineering projects to try to evolve uh, or, or design or engineer a capsid that has that ability um, so that now you can go after those diseases. So that's kind of one bucket um, of kind of engineering projects. So making AAVs have an entirely new behavior or characteristic or phenotype that's not currently, you know, capable with the existing naturally, exi naturally existing serotypes. Um, another project that we have in the lab um, uh, is a project that we call universal payloads. 
right? So if you think about every disease we really kind of have ever gone after in AAV gene therapy, um, it's personalized. So it's not personalized for an individual patient, but it is personalized um, for, for that disease. So you can't treat a, a young girl with X-linked myotubular myopathy with the AAV that you made for a young boy with hemophilia B. The, the genes are different, the pathways are different, everything is different. Uh, but if you could come up with payloads um, that could be multi-use, then that would be a way that you could also make AAVs cheaper because now you can reuse them over and over and now it becomes more like a MAB. Um, there is innovation um, in not just in my lab, but I know numerous groups who are working on things like new, um, new, all of the components that go into the genome part. So things like the promoter, things like the enhancer, things like the ITRs, um, which, you know, the dirty little secret of the AAV field is that I don't think there are two labs on this planet, be they academia or industry, that have the exact same ITRs. Um, they're very different in their length, their sequence, their structure. Um, I, we have protocols that we've developed in the lab for develop for, um, for sequencing AVITRs, which are these very recombinogenic um, structured sequences. And we've offered to sequence plasmids from our collaborators, both in academia and in industry and commercially available ones that are being sold. Um, and I don't think we have ever received a plasmid um, that was like any other plasmid we had ever sequenced or that was what is touted, right? Which is the wild type AAV sequence of two AAV ITRs that are 145 base pairs in the flip and flop orientations. Um, I've never seen it. <laughs> yeah. So there's a lot of innovation that can happen there. Um, also at innovations around um, one of the biggest challenges that we have with patients, right? Uh, we all want to treat every single patient uh, that has the disease for the program that we're going after. But one of the problems is that we have things like pre-existing neutralizing antibodies in patients that will preclude some patients from being eligible to be able to, to receive the infusion because they'd simply sop it up with the antibodies in their bloodstream. So it wouldn't actually be able to be effective. And so there's like kind of a whole new class of, of, of researchers and efforts in that space to try to come up with new technologies to make sure that those patients could be eligible up front to receive the, the therapy in the first place, but also potentially maybe 20 years from now, um, if the expression is starting to wane and go down, we'd love to be able to redose all of those patients so that their disease doesn't, doesn't rear back. And so there's really kind of infinite, and things that I can't even dream up, things that uh, you know students and trainees 10 years from now are gonna dream up um, that will get us past a number of these hurdles. It really is a, a, a crazy constellation of things that can get better, quite frankly, <laughs> but one of them that I wanna highlight is, and you started off with this was capsid development. You know, the report does a really good job of explaining that creating a perfect capsid for AAV um, is an extremely difficult proposition. And if you don't have the right capsid that is universal, um, it makes the manufacturing process alone very difficult. Eric, your team at Dino is working on building the perfect capsid. If not the perfect one, then as close to perfect as possible. Um, I'd love to hear more about that and exactly what spurred that quest. I know that Nicole highlighted very well that how the capsules that we use to deliver those therapies are just imperfect right now. So what is your team at Dino um, doing with this work on capsid development? Um, happy to speak to that, Kyle. Thanks, Nikki, for helping to set the stage. Um, you know, one of the things that was highlighted in the article was that uh, a lot of the field today is using the same capsids, uh, which are actually natural uh, capsids, meaning that uh, they were, the capsid sequences taken from um, a natural virus, which was isolated from a patient or from a, um, kind of prospecting studies. And, and the reason for that is not really because they're perfect, but just because those are the best things we had at the time and matched with the huge unmet need to develop develop new therapies to treat uh, a huge number of genetic diseases. So um, what it means is that there's great room for improvement. And that's where um, my work for the past about six years has been focused. And in the recent two years, we've started a company, Dino Therapeutics, uh, completely focused on this problem of making a better capsid, not, not just the perfect capsid, but enough capsids that can cover you know, the majority of the needs of the field. For example, a great capsid for going in uh, to the liver, to the CNS, to the muscle, to the eye, where a lot of the activity is today. But even then, there was a roadmap for developing better capsids in the CNS. You know, you want to hit the glial cells and the neurons. And in the neurons, you have different types of neurons. So there is going to be an evolution, I hope, uh, of developing better capsids, which will progressively enable us to treat more diseases, including some of the organs, like Nikki highlighted, the kidney uh, or the lung or even the heart where a more specific capsid would also be really transformative by opening up those new frontiers of the field uh, to, uh, 
companies who can help uh, develop therapies to treat those patients. Uh, so I can say that this is not um, an, a new problem. In fact, there's so many people who are working on this. Um, it's, it's been a challenge from the very beginning of the field. And you know the reason why it hasn't really been solved yet, I, I can highlight a few of the challenges there. Um, one of them is just that proteins themselves are really complex machines. We don't understand a lot about how they work, meaning that we can't make a change and really predict whether it's going to improve the function or break the function. So that's a challenge which is true for any protein, but AAV in particular is a very complex protein. It's 60 different pieces that come together to form the shell and it has to go through all sorts of rearrangements in order to accomplish its function of delivering uh, DNA into a patient's cells. So that's, that's one challenge. The second is that because we you know, quickly adapted it from natural uh, variants to use for therapeutic purposes, uh, we, we didn't have enough time to really understand how it interacts with the body. So in terms of the AV basic biology plus how AV interacts with cells and receptors on human cells, those are a lot of the challenges which have made it difficult to rationally engineer uh, the capsid to make it better. So people have fallen back to the next best thing, which is um, a more empirical approach called directed evolution. Typically that means randomly mutating the sequence and looking for that needle in a haystack, that rare variant, which has some improved function. And so that's, that's been an effort which is ongoing for more than 15 years now, but it hasn't yielded a lot of successes um, for, for two reasons. One is that those improved variants, those needles in a haystack, they're, they're quite rare, but importantly, they need to be improved across multiple different dimensions. So we need to improve the efficiency of delivery, the specificity of delivery, um, we need to do that while at least not breaking the manufacturability of the capsid, but hopefully also improving it, as well as some other things like um, avoiding pre-existing immunity, which would enable us to treat all patients. So being able to make it AV, which was improved across multiple dimensions, has just been beyond our means as protein engineers up until recently. And this is why I got into the field was thanks to some new technologies, uh, I felt it was going to be possible to really accelerate the the way in which we can engineer any, any protein for a new function for, for kind of two reasons. Um, one is that we now have the ability to kind of augment our knowledge of how to engineer the proteins through high throughput screening, in particular driven by kind of next generation DNA synthesis and next generation DNA sequencing. So what that enables us to do is to, rather than having to understand how to improve the function, we can just make a very large number of different changes, even systematically search that space and then do an experiment. And then from that experiment, learn you know, directly the mapping between the sequence and the function. In particular, we can, for example, synthesize 100,000 different AV sequences, pull them together, and then one animal read out which tissue do they go to, even what cell types do they go to. So that greatly expands the amount of information we have about how to engineer a better AV we can measure those properties across multiple dimensions, and that's how we can select for these improvements across multiple functions. Um, and we can do that testing in the most relevant models. In particular, uh, much of the field, rightfully so, is focused on um, doing the early preclinical work in non-human primates, because that's the best model we have for the safety and for the efficacy of delivery when we want to translate those therapies to humans. And the challenge of doing the engineering in a primate metal has also been something that's been beyond the means of most academic labs or companies up until recently. So we developed this really high throughput approach so that we could make the best use of those more complex and expensive experiments in primates and engineer the capsids in a way that would be more likely to translate and be useful than for a human therapeutic. So that's where a lot of our work is focused. Um, there's a few other technologies that we use and love uh, because we feel they are really right for this problem. And one of those is in addition to making the experiments high throughput, we also want to automate the analysis of those experiments so that we can learn more from the patterns that we see in the data. So our approach there is to apply machine learning, which is actually the perfect solution for this problem. You can take a set of data, train a model on that and ask that model to predict the function of the remainder that the model has never seen. And if you can do that, then it means that now you have a model which can predict you know, new functions and use that to design the next library. So then we've also taken the step of automating the, the design of new capsids and that closes the loop. So we can go back and make a new library again of 100,000 or more different variants 
And by iterating on this process across all the different areas that are important for gene therapy, that's how we hope to develop the next generation of capsids, you know, a small number, call it 10 to 50 different capsids, which can serve the needs of the field. Uh, one thing that makes Dino unique is that um, we're really focused on this problem and we see ourselves as one of the leaders in this space. And this is really our area of core expertise. We want to have the biggest impact we can on patients. And what that means is that at least today, we're not developing our own uh, gene therapy product. Rather, we're working with partners, including some of the leaders of the field, uh, like Novartis, Sarepta, and Roche, uh, to add their payloads to our capsules. And then our partners are responsible for the downstream preclinical and clinical development and ultimately commercialization of those therapies. And we've taken this approach because uh, we feel this is the way that we can, through our efforts, uh, enable others and have the broadest impact that we can, the most positive impact on patients across the field. So that's a little bit um, about you know, what got me into this field, having worked in those technologies and seeing that there would be a lot of potential. And uh, since we started the company about two years ago, it's been a really uh, just amazing time. Uh, we've, we've grown quite a lot. We're right now at 45 people and continuing to grow. And uh, I would say the field has been really receptive to the idea of new capsids. It's, it's an area that many are, are challenged by. And this approach is, is different enough that we're very optimistic that it, it could be the one which would solve this problem for good and then enable us to treat all these um, rare monogenetic diseases, other common genetic diseases, and even, as Nikki said, some uh, kind of more common uh, uh, polygenetic or non-genetic diseases that could enable everyone to benefit from a gene therapy at some point in their lifetime. Yeah, I think the target perspective on that is really interesting, the possibilities there. I would I would be remiss though to not ask you about the manufacturing aspect of this as well. You know, as Nicole said, um, manufacturing these therapies at scale are a huge issue. The FDA has had uh, a say in particular on a, a couple of late stage projects getting across the finish lines, specifically tied to their manufacturing. In terms of building a better capsid, what is the effect in your mind on how that's gonna change um, the manufacturing paradigm in this industry? Well, I would say what many of our partners are interested in, and if you ask anyone who's doing gene therapy, you know, what's top of mind, the manufacturing is important, but what really is key is improving the efficiency of delivery. And it's fortunate that if you can solve that problem, for example, if you can make an AV, which is 10 times or even hundred times more effective than the starting point, that also makes it easier to manufacture enough doses to treat all the patients who would benefit from that therapy. So you can either, for example, treat new diseases because now you're able to deliver to enough cells to make a difference in terms of patient quality of life, or you can dose with a 10 times or hundred times lower dose. And therefore you can make the therapy safer uh, and also make it easier to manufacture enough to treat all the patients who would need to benefit. So I see that as being really like the first area, both in terms of expanding the frontiers of the field and in terms of removing that bottleneck through manufacturing that will see improvement. Additionally, because um, we're the question was about the safety, and that's how we started this um, this this call. Uh, another area that the natural AVs are not so good at because there was never a reason from an evolutionary perspective to target one tissue or one cell type specifically, is that they're quite broad. Uh, for example, most AV gene therapies, even if you're targeting say the CNS uh, or the muscle, a, a very large number of those are going to the liver or being filtered out through the circulation when they're delivered uh, systemically. And so through engineering, we can also detarget the AVs from those other organs where you know, going there is not as important for the effectiveness of the therapy. And that, uh, can also make them more effective and, and certainly better tolerated uh, so that we're able to avoid some of the safety concerns or risks associated with the therapies using the natural capsids. Yeah, I think that's really compelling. And again, like both Eric and Nicole have highlighted here, a lot of room for innovation and improvement on how AAVs are delivered. To get to sort of the beyond AAV 1.0 part of this discussion, um, both Jeff McKay and Jeff McDonough are working outside of AAV altogether. And you know, we had a call before this one to sort of talk about this and everyone I think made mention that AAV is not going anywhere. There's a field still very much in its infancy if you consider the last decade, but there are also approaches really at the cutting edge of how we do these gene therapies that do not rely on AAV. Um, and I, Jeff McKay, I'd love to start with you. Your team is working on a lentiviral approach um, that does away with AAVs altogether. 
um, looking, you know, potentially to solve all of these issues you just talked about in terms of potency and safety and even manufacturing down the road. Tell us about um, your team's work and how you think lentiviral gene therapy can potentially solve the issues of AAV, which are, is obviously an imperfect delivery technology. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. So uh, AvroBio, um, as you mentioned, applies lentiviral gene therapy to multiple lysosomal storage disorders. And uh, we're targeting six different lysosomal disorders. Uh, Fabry, Gaucher, Pompa, Cystinosis, Hunter, Gaucher disease type three. And, um, and, and as you said, I think each, each approach has its pros and cons, but I think the, the benefit of Lenti as an integrating vector is, uh, you know, if you think of one word, you think of durability. Um, so that, that's one differentiator. But of, of course it doesn't have, you know, it has its own profile, but it doesn't have the emerging challenges of liver toxicity or immunogenicity. And so, you know, I, I guess when, when we look at this field, we, we certainly, you know, and the reason that we're having a panel here, here is because AAV is clearly, AAV generation one is clearly facing emerging limitations. And, and you know, I, I think it's been said clearly, but just to repeat a little bit that this emerging pattern of liver toxicity, immunogenicity, you know, we were all sort of jarred and shocked at the tragic deaths of the Adentes patients, but it's more than that. It's an emerging pattern of three, four, five companies. Jim Wilson's, of course, large primate data corroborates it. Um, and there's durability issues. And, and so it, it's unclear whether the first gen can overcome that. Of course, there's all kinds of mitigating approaches and, and we're all hopeful. But then a second topic gets introduced is if you do address those safety and durability issues, the next question is for which patient segments would it be suitable? And there are certainly sizable uh, patient segments where, where it, it, it at least has limitations. And as, as, always, as has already been referenced, you know, X percent of patients have pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. And depending on which publication you reference, which geography you, you measure, which serotype, it could be 20%, it could be 60%, but it's, it's X percent. It's bigger than a bread box. You know, it, it's a sizable percentage of patients. And then the second limitation, which we all understand is pediatrics adolescence, because of course, for a non-integrating vector as the liver grows, there's concern about washout. And, and the third, which particularly bridges to Lenti, is uh, if, if you open up the big book of medicine and target a disease where what you require is both an above and a below the neck manifestation, you know, a liver directed AAV is certainly challenged to, to be able to address that. AAV has been shown in CNS and it's been shown in the periphery, but it, it really, there, there's not a viable approach to, to deliver both. And, and so, you know, that, that's part of the challenge, but the second half of the challenge, though what I mentioned to date is what's intrinsically difficult about the first gen AAV approach. But apart from the intrinsic issues is how we as industry have applied it. And I think that, you know, we've applied it to diseases that are perhaps not the ideal fit. And in drug development in general, of course, you're not supposed to start with the technology. You're supposed to start with a target product profile. And if you set yourself and your patients up for success, what you want to do is match the vector to the disease and specifically to the target product profile, what you're trying to do to the disease. And, you know, I, I would assert that AAV vectors are inherently well suited for delivery to non dividing cells in highly targeted compartmentalized organs, such as the brain and the eye. And of course, we all know about Luxterna and Zolgensma, um, where washout's not an issue. Um, the, the cells, the retina and the motor neurons don't divide, and you can get away with a relatively small dose. Where we see Lenti fitting is not across the board, but if what you really require is a lifelong distribution of an active protein, head to toe, meaning in all of the, what we call hard to reach compartments and notably the central nervous system, we think that Lenti sidesteps or just doesn't deal, doesn't have to face the liver toxicity immunogenicity issues, doesn't have any of the patient exclusions in terms of pre-existing neutralizing antibodies, pediatrics, adolescents, or if you desire to hit the CNS effect. And at least to date, you know, there's a dozen indications, now two to three approvals, um, 300 to 500 patients treated a thousand patient years of experience. 
And, and the, the main thing that we see is no waning of effect over time. So if that's important in the target product profile, I think that that's a, a differentiator for the Lenti approach. And then, you know, the, the other issue is it's not for every indication. You also don't want to target a disease where there's a narrow therapeutic window, because of course, you know, we just have this, you know, spewing out, we, we leverage the progeny of the bone marrow cells to manufacture and deliver protein head to toe. So I think if you match it to the disease, and we would assert, of course, that lysosomal disorders are a good match, but of course, others have already demonstrated inherited blood disorders and primary immunodeficiencies are also a good match. So we think there is a segment of our broad field of genetic medicine where Lenti has some pretty important, you know, differential advantages. Yeah, and you know, I, you know, I find this area very interesting. And you, you'll all have to excuse me for going back to manufacturing and a different life as a manufacturing reporter for pharma. But one, the question I have for Lindsay, you know, is there is an established, despite it being imperfect, an established manufacturing setup. Part of the challenge with this field, and we'll talk to Jeff McDonough about this as well, is getting that manufacturing up to speed, really working at the cutting edge of this technology. So my question for you is, you know, AAV is high profile manufacturing issues. From a manufacturing front, how does lentiviral gene therapy solve that issue? Well, just to simplify for us, we have two challenges, right? We have to manufacture the vector and we have to manufacture the, the drug product, which are the gene modified cells. And I think we've made big inroads in both. Um, right now, the field, I think there's two or three groups. We're one of them that is operating today in what we would call large bioreactors. It doesn't sound large by the AAV standard, but a 200 liter serum free suspension bioreactor with a 10 to the ninth titer means each run can treat enough, uh, enough vector to, to treat 40 to 50 patients. And so you can start to do easy math that if we have three suites and we do a run a week, you know, we, we can treat thousands of patients a year. And if you wanted to double that, you go to six suites. So we would, argue that today we can meet the needs of even sizable rare diseases. And of course, the vector is cryopreserved, inventory. So we think already it, it is what it always should be, which is a long lead time critical raw material, but not more. Now, when you get into the, the you know, Nicole mentioned, you know, mass markets, cardiovascular, we and others are working on stable producer cell lines already. And I think there's some pretty exciting research there that would then, you know, catch up with our colleagues in monoclonals and really just to be able to, to mass produce. But we have a separate challenge. We also have to make the, the gene modified cells. And the big advance there is to my knowledge, I hate speaking in absolutes, but to my knowledge, we're the only group that is operating today in, in closed system automated uh, manufacturers. So that helps. I mean, that can increase scale tenfold. We can have rows of these enclosed automated pods, house them in low grade clean rooms in CMOs around the world. And you know that also can get you to thousands of patients a year pretty comfortably, but I think even further work needs to be had on the drug product side to really meet those, those mass market indications. Great. Um, moving on to Jeff McDonough, we've now moving out beyond beyond AV 1.0 to a totally non-viral approach. Jeff, um, I read with great interest um, uh, your team's work on a close into DNA loop and effectively trying to make a better gene therapy that did, doesn't need a viral vector at all. Um, that would be a huge development in a lot of different ways, but I'm, I'm, I'll turn it over to you because I find this very fascinating. Talk about your team's work here um, and then potentially the transformative effects of getting something like this uh, to function in much the same way as an AAV or lentiviral approach without needing that vector. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. And I mean, what an awesome setup. Uh, each of you guys have just laid a, a beautiful landscape where so much is to be done and where so much of that work will lead to terrific benefit and expanded benefit. And, you know, that idea of, of building on the benefits of, of AAV and Lenti and working to expand and extend those to broader populations and to new uh, indications and also to reach for a slightly different clinical profile has really been the goal of non-viral gene therapy for 40 years. I mean, those same uh, gatherings of scientists wearing genes in the basement were also talking about non-viral gene therapy 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago. 
Um, so that the idea of, of what non-viral gene therapy could offer has been around for quite some time. And, and simply it's to build on what is really wonderful about viral gene therapy in general, which is the ability to introduce therapeutic transgenes, sometimes smaller versions, but often in their entirety to the nuclei of target cells. That's an incredibly broad uh, therapeutic platform to build on, uh, whether it's in mitotic or, or non-mitotic cells. Um, and so, you know, what, what we're trying to do is build on that therapeutic potential, but remove the limitations, which are fundamentally driven by, as you said, Eric, natural capses, which exclude many patients at the outset and prevent redosing. And if you just step back from it, from a clinical perspective, um, almost all drugs, all therapeutic categories allow redosing and allow for adjustment of dosing or dose frequency to get the right outcome for each patient, individualizing therapy to the goals of a given patient is a very natural and, and embedded sort of a principle in clinical medicine. And of course, the, the viral approach, at least for, for 1.0, doesn't quite allow for that uh, repeat dosing to occur. So getting the same kind of years long durability in the nucleus and combining that with redosing has always a little bit been the dream of non-viral gene therapy. And uh, I think it was said really clearly and very well earlier, it's about delivery, delivery, delivery. How do you get, if you don't have the benefit of the magic of all the billions of years that have yielded um, AAV or, or Lenti uh, structures, how do you get DNA into the nucleus of target cells? And how do you do it specifically in a format that's redosable? So it's pretty natural that at least a generation bio and our, our founding, this idea of combining, as you pointed out, a novel DNA vector closed-ended DNA, which does, Nicole, have exactly these ITRs on each end, like AAV, but in contrast, the AAV is double-stranded and covalently closed-ended. What's special about that structure for Sedna is that it does yield the same durability in the nucleus as AAV, but unlike AAV, without capsid, if you can get Sedna to the cytoplasm, it makes its way into the nucleus. So, so that's a, a critical differentiating feature of the construct, which lets you access a second technology, which is lipid nanoparticle delivery. Lipid nanoparticles by their nature don't exclude patients up front because patients don't have naturally occurring antibodies to LNPs and they allow essentially unlimited repeat dosing, or at least in the context of the approved drugs that are using LNPs, uh, allow for chronic dosing every several weeks for years. So that concept of redosing and long-term expression in the nucleus was the kind of peanut butter and chocolate, if you will, that, that got Generation Bio started. As it turns out, um, some of those same on-target, off-target ratio issues that are there for AAV exist for standard LNPs as it relates to delivering DNA. In other words, standard LNPs deliver 50% of their cargo to immune cells and 50% to hepatocytes. If we just talk about the liver as a target to begin with, so much of our work over the last three years to answer your question, Kyle, has been on inventing a novel biologically cell targeted delivery system, again, beginning with the liver, but we have in mind to reach other tissues, using uh, GALNAC to target the ASGPR uh, on hepatocytes. And so in contrast to this 50-50, we are now delivering 97% of all copies to hepatocytes with each dose. So very different shift in the biodistribution of, of standard uh, lipid nanoparticles. So that unlocks this kind of combination of years long durability and redosability. And what that gives you in terms of reach are you know, really three uh, or four dimensions. One is because you're not stuck inside a fixed dimension of the capsid, you can build larger payloads. So up to 15 kilobases, which includes most of the cDNAs that we know are therapeutically interesting. Um, because you can redose at the outset of therapy to stack to the right level of expression for each patient, it becomes more individualized and it unlocks the ability to dose in childhood. As Jeff McKay was saying, if you can't redose early in childhood, you can't keep up with the growth of the liver. Um, and lastly, but importantly, I mean, Nicole, you said it right at the beginning, how do you get to every patient on earth with a given indication, let alone if it's prevalent? Um, when you move away from some of the manufacturing constraints of, of capsid, you have a capsid-free manufacturing process, then millions of doses really come into, into reach. So then you can start to build on the successes of AAV, but try to extend that reach uh, to larger populations. And by the way, I don't think our biologics capacity is sufficient to treat every man, woman, and child on earth with a, with a large indication. So moving that manufacturing from steel vats 
into patients' own livers, you know, becomes a really interesting long-term extension of this kind of an approach. So, so that's a big nutshell, but in a nutshell, that's, that's what we're up to. Yeah, you know, one of the questions we had, Jeff, moving into this was the, uh, that exactly when you talked about a therapeutic reach and how you use this lipid nanoparticle in a targeted way. You know, there's a compelling line in the report saying, hey, these are, are built like a bullet, that they're really, really targeted for specific tissues. Uh, one of the exciting things about what you're doing is it has the same response as an AAV delivered gene therapy, but it doesn't need the vector. In terms of, you talked about this briefly, but in terms of how you're thinking about expanding that out or how to really target down on specific tissues, can you drill down for us what your team is doing in terms of working on tissue specific targeting? Um, I, I don't know if how you view it as being, we can do it as well as an AAV down the road, but um, talk about that problem. Yeah. I mean, if we start with the liver, just briefly, that 97% specificity to the hepatocyte compartment is, is very different from what's possible with, with, with current natural generation or first generation, if you will, uh, capsid um, delivery. Uh, and it, it comes along with that opportunity to move from targeted rare and metabolic indications in the liver like PKU or uh, using the liver for rare diseases like HEMA, two of our lead programs. Um, and of course, there's lots of depth in similar monogenic uh, conditions in the liver, but it also allows you to build within the liver to address very large prevalent indications. So for example, the ability to generate therapeutic antibodies from the patient's own liver, perhaps with one dose or two doses every five years to gain a protective level of antibodies against something like hepatitis B or HIV or COVID, knowing that patients are producing their own antibodies, it gets past some of those capacity limitations for very large uh, indications. Now, having said that, um, if you take off the GALNAC targeting ligand, it opens the opportunity to put back on a ligand that's specific, for example, for tumors or for skeletal muscle or for other hard to reach tissues. Uh, Nicole, you caught my eye. Uh, we've been thinking about the kidney uh, a lot too in the longer term, because it is, it's untouchable today and, and there's so many great things to do there. Now. The, the specific ligands that have the kind of characteristics as um, GALNAC does for the ASGPR are not thick on the ground. There are many validated uh, such molecules for skeletal muscle. There are many such molecules for uh, tumors. There are not so many for kidney. There are not so many for the central nervous system. So we're doing a balanced approach, taking advantage of places where others have identified those kinds of ligands, but also developing the ability to discover and develop those ourselves uh, as well over the longer term. Great. Guys, this has been a fantastic discussion. We are absolutely swamped in questions for q I've been seeing them fly by. It's great. They're coming yeah. in. People love this topic. So we, uh, we're going to turn over to that really quickly with the last 18 minutes we have. I think we've got some really, really great stuff to talk about. Let me start with the general one and we'll turn it over. And I think this question really gets to the heart of what we've been talking about here. Um, this is to the entire group. Feel free to jump in. Did the panel comment on potency, question mark, the amount of the virus required for a dose on a per cell quote unquote basis, suggests AAV is a very poor virus based on infectivity. What are we doing to improve potency? Uh, I can probably take a stab at that. So, um, so there are definitely differences uh, with AAV potency depending on a number of factors, what capsid you're using, what tissue you're going after, what method of administration you're using, and even how you manufacture it. Um, so we've got a, a recent paper that came out in September that showed that um, there are huge potency differences, even if you make the exact same virus, same capsid, same payload, same everything, um, but you manufacture it in the human HEC-293 platform versus the Baculos F9 platform, where we can see orders of magnitude difference in the potency uh, between these two platforms where the human produced vector is much more potent than the insect produced vector. So there are huge differences. There are a number of factors that kind of play into this um, that you can dial up or dial down and change. As far as ways that people are trying to improve potency beyond that, I think um, there are groups who are working on um, new methods of administration. Um, so right now, uh, the two tissues that everyone is most jealous of and want to work in are the brain and the eye because you can do these really, really low doses uh, where you don't need to have really high levels of potency or high levels of transduction or, or high doses in order to achieve truly therapeutic levels of expression. But can we get other organs to, to have that huge advantage that the brain and the eye have um, through, through new methods of administration that aren't just brute force systemic um, infusion in, into the vasculature. Um, so I think that is a kind of a new area that people are playing in and also just engineering the capsids themselves. Eric can, can certainly talk about this in more detail, engineering the, the actual capsids to be more potent um, so that you could administer a few of them. 
um, and, and also all of those genomic components that, that get packaged into that payload. Can any of those be stronger or more tightly controlled or regulated in some way? Um, those are all kind of initial, uh, initial technologies that people are working on in order to make these more potent beyond just improvements in their own um, kind of process development pathway. I guess maybe I could add a few things um, to what Nikki so, so thoughtfully covered. Um, I, I, you know, the potency is, is really the same thing as the efficiency. So it is a, a major focus for our work and a major need. Um, and I think you know, the state of the field today is we're achieving amazing things, even though the tools we have available are, are still, you know, relatively first generation immature, and there's just so much room for improvement. I think that's, it's, it's a great reason for optimism as we figure out how to um, kind of do the things that we need. Uh, we can learn from the examples of other fields or, you know, for example, one report that I've always found really interesting from um, Michael Linden's lab was about the differences between natural AVs, you know, which are in their natural form, which is slightly different from how they're used in gene therapy, which is recombinant AV and looking at the per particle infectivity of those and seeing a pretty big difference, like at least tenfold or more. So is there something about the way we're manufacturing and that makes the particles less infectious? And certainly a challenge that many have on the manufacturing side is the empty full ratio of the capsids. Because if you have capsids which are completely empty then they're not, they're not doing any benefit to the patient when you administer those. And so filtering those out has been a major challenge, is a major challenge when you manufacture gene therapies at large scale. But maybe we can learn what the natural viruses are doing that makes them, you know, have a almost perfect particle infectivity ratio, like every particle is infectious. If we can learn what they're doing, not only in the capsid side, but also how we manufacture that, that also is one error dimension for improvement. And, you know, I think that we're beginning to figure that out. As I said, it's still really early days. We don't know a lot about how natural AD works or how it interacts with the body. So there is a lot of value still in basic research to try to understand, you know, what we can from nature and then apply that uh, for what we're doing therapeutically. Great. And, and we've got another general question before we get to that. I've got a couple of targeted ones. This is for Jeff McKay. Um, viewer asked, does the integration of lentiviral cargo into the genome pose a safety concern or can you control how and where it integrates in order to avoid toxicity? Um, <clears throat> so you can never rule out a safety concern. There's a theoretical safety concern. We don't see uh, insertional mutagenesis in the thousand patient years tracked to date, but of course it's a concern. I would say with Lenti, there's a strong bias for the vector to integrate its payload in the bodies of genes away from areas that control cell growth. Um, and so, you know, that's perhaps part of the reason why we're not seeing it. I would remind people, and this is more of a general comment, is that Lenti is deactivated HIV. And uh, we have seven, 70 million patients in the world to look at and to ask, are we seeing insertional mutagenesis? And the answer is no. So I, you know, I, I don't think we can rule out it as a theoretical. I'd also highlight, you know, one of the big news stories of the year on the AAV side was the Sabatino uh, study in AAV looking at 1700 unique integration sites and expanded cell clones and half of which uh, we're near genes that regulate cell growth. So that actually, you know, if anything, creates a bigger question on the AAV, AAV side of the ledger. But, you know, I think we can say so far so good. Uh, the results are not showing that with Lenti, but of course, it, it's an area that we continue to track. Great. And, and Jeff McDonough, direct question for you as well. Um, short and sweet, what does the animal data show with nucleic acids in, in LNP? Um, maybe I'll answer the question a couple different ways. You know, nucleic acids in LNPs form the basis for many therapeutic categories, sRNA, siRNA, mRNA, all have utilized uh, LNPs for delivery. Um, importantly, all of those modalities are delivered to the cytoplasm and are active in the cytoplasm. And what is beautiful about that body of data is, I'll just highlight two or three things. One, LNPs show really uniform, consistent, and robust biodistribution uh, in the liver. A single dose of LNP, uh, and now I refer to the l nylum uh, data set, really can get to 90% of, of hepatocytes, each dose 90%. So the biodistribution is, is pretty good. And 
the um, uh, reproducibility of data in non-human primates to humans is essentially one-to-one. -one. So it's very predictive, this translation from, from non-human primates to, to humans. And that is a really nice boon for development, as Eric was pointing out. You know, you really want to do your work in NHP, and if you can count on that translation, it's it's very helpful. Um, and uh, lastly, you know, this this core property of redosability and not excluding patients up front uh, has been has been nicely demonstrated uh, in across a variety of platforms. Um, there are not many examples of LNP being used to deliver DNA, and that's really the this because of this um, off-target distribution that I mentioned, which is the core property we've engineered into our CTLNP. Now, when we use our uh, Sedna with CTLNP uh, in mice, we're able to see these properties uh, demonstrated, for example, uh, the ability to create high and durable levels of expression for factor eight and factor nine, and also in the case of factor nine to show redosing with a stacking and increase of, of expression in a dose proportionate way. Um, now we are just setting down the data set to show this translation of the combination of closed ended DNA constructs with CTLNPs in non-human primates for factor eight. We showed that a translational ratio is somewhere between one to one and three to one uh, in our first uh, NHP experiments there. Um, so the next step will be to bring our therapeutic constructs for hemophilia A into non-human primates and demonstrate that same combination of, of Sedna and CTLNP. So that's maybe some bookends for the, the experience so far with LNPs and nucleic acid. Of course, the delivery of nucleic acid with LNPs is the heart of the story for COVID vaccines, it's just a very different application of, of the technology. Yeah. Great. Um, touching here on AAV immunity, this is open to the panel. How do you weigh the promise of capsid engineering compared to more clinically advanced solutions? Here's me as a non-scientist trying to say this, plasmapheresis, IDS, treatment, immunosuppression, et cetera. I'd, I'd like to say that um, it is, it's a major challenge for the field to engineer AVs, which can be used to treat any patient. Um, it's one of the things that uh, I've thought a lot about and a lot of our work is directed towards this goal. And the reason why it's challenging is that you really need to change the entire surface of the capsid, like resurface it so that it's no longer recognized by the immune system, which is a pretty difficult engineering challenge. It's you know, gonna require hundreds of different mutations uh, to the surface. And luckily that's one thing that these new approaches, these high throughput approaches for generating data and then analyzing that is something that they're very good at. We, we have shown kind of in, at the proof of concept stage, the ability to mutate almost every position within the protein within a small region. And if we continue to apply that across other regions, then I think we, we will be able to make a more universal vector that could benefit every patient. But that's still a lot of work needs to go into that. Um, there was in the comment, the mention of some of these other approaches like plasmapheresis or um, the IDS uh, treatments, I, I think those are all wonderful. And like, there's no reason why you couldn't combine new capsids with additional ways of modulating uh, or directing the immune system that could in combination enable you know, more patients to benefit from the therapies or even enable things like the redose, uh, which would be you know, fantastic to add into the AV field. Great, and uh, for this next one, Nicole, you got a direct shout out. Um, not to name names, a, a participant in a recent trial for hemophilia B developed hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, if it's discovered that AAV has contributed to this through in, inter, intertional, I don't know if that's a misspell, mutagenesis, what impact will this have on the AAB, AAV rather based gene therapy field? Nicole, since you got the shout out, I figured you could start with that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the jury is still out on this. Um, there's still an investigation going into kind of what's going on there. Um, I don't know when it will be public and when we'll be able to hear about it. Um, but certainly this, this concept, this debate is not new in the AAV field. There's, um, I, I have commented recently on this that, um, you know, this is, this is an area that can get you into a bar fight uh, at ASGCT. Uh, there are really, there are two camps. There's the camp that says that AAV can um, insert uh, into the genome. This is largely always in, in, in liver, um, liver directed gene therapies, uh, that it can integrate into the liver and that this can cause tumors uh, depending on where it integrates. And then there's also an equally large contingent of folks who say that it does not do that at all. Um, 
I won't necessarily weigh <laughs> which group I fall into. Um, but if, you know, hypothetically it, it was to, we were to definitively show and everybody agreed um, that this still caught, that this was definitive, this was causative, this caused this insertional mutagenesis that led to this tumor. I still don't think that would be the end of AAB gene therapy for liver diseases. I think we would just, you know, we would act like we're scientists and we would engineer solutions around this problem um, to try to stop uh, the, the integration um, in these particular sites and or um, be more selective about which types of diseases we would go after um, and at what doses we, we would be using these things. So I think even if it were to come back uh, that this was an absolutely definitively AAV induced um, tumor, I still don't think that would end AAV gene therapy in the liver by a long shot. Great, and let's go uh, beyond AAV 1.0 times three. The question here is looking at something that's outside the range of what we've all of us have talked about here, and that's testing new types of viruses for delivery. Um, what's the current status of other viruses being tested in this space? Um, I'll leave it open to the panel. Um, anything that's outside of the range of what we've currently discussed, Nicole, you may be good to start on that. Oh gosh, there's more viruses than I can count. There are more academic labs and small startups and even large companies who are going after things beyond the, the three classics, right? Which is adenovirus, AAV, and Lenti. Um, so truly um, hundreds, possibly even thousands of viruses in consideration. So many, many, many. <laughs> yeah. And, and non viral stuff. So, and they, I think they'll all have, not all thousand, but uh, right, like these will all have a place. Like there's going to be indications where AAV is best. There's going to be indications where adeno is best. There's going to be indications where lenti is best. There's going to be indications where non viral things are best. Um, so there's enough sand in the sandbox for everybody to play with. There's, depending on who you talk to, 8,000 or more um, rare monogenic diseases, and that's just in the monogenic space. So there's enough diseases for all of us to go after. Um. Great. And let me, let me maybe highlight something here from a, from a reader who asked about integration for AAV. Um, I'll read it directly. Isn't it a little unfair to single out AAV with respect to unintended integration? Isn't the truth that the introduction of DNA into a cell slash nucleus will always run a risk of unintended integration, whether via AAV, LNT, or LNT? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I, so when you say, is there a risk, uh, of course, I, I think perhaps the question, I mean, this has been a year because of the publication that I referenced briefly, the Sabatino publication, which is a long-term pen study looking at dogs, um, looking at the 1700 unique integrations and expanded cell clones. I think it's raised the question, you know, because we used to live in the simple world where AAV didn't integrate and Lenti did, and there were pros and cons of each, where I think the world's getting a little bit more complicated now. And that's forcing us to ask safety related questions that we, we weren't perhaps appropriately asking until recently. But I think the science is unfolding and I, I don't know how anybody could make strong conclusions right now. I think we're still trying to sort things out. Okay, um, we have two minutes. So let's have this be the last question for the session here. Um, to all the panelists, does it make sense to optimize capsid slash cargo sequences separately and in parallel or can we do both together? I mean, I, th well, I think it makes sense. I'll, I'll, I'll try first and then I'll, I'll leave some space. I think it makes sense to try to make them as modular as possible. That would be ideal so that you could reuse the same vector to treat multiple different indications. And it may not always be perfect. There might be some customization is needed, but you know, in, a, in an ideal world, we could engineer the capsid or engineer the payloads so that they would work you know, with whatever way you want to match them together. I would have said exactly the same thing, Eric. <laughs> Modularity is key. Hmm. Okay, well, listen, we've got about a minute and a half left to go. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all the panelists for being here. I think this is a fantastic discussion. We had a ton of people logged on. I think there's a lot of interest from all the questions and answers that we got. This is a great way to kick it off. I want to say for people who maybe have logged on as we've been going that this is the first in a monthly series for us at Endpoints titled In Focus, where we'll be tackling the biggest topics in biopharma. Today was AAV. Next month is preclinical r and I'll be tackling that report and the webinar. So I hope you'll log on for that and check in. Um, reach out, keep in touch with us. If you have any questions further, we'll be doing more gene therapy coverage as we go along. So, you know, we're going to be on this constantly. We'll be in contact with all the voices we have here. I want to thank you all again. 
Um, and with just a few seconds left to go, thank you. See y'all soon. Thanks so much, guys. Thanks, everyone. Enjoyed it. Bye-bye.